coming up. In a worldwide conflict that involved millions from many nations, a great deal of heroes and legends would be created. However, there are also villains created in these same events whose stories, however dastardly, must also be shared. In this video, we will take a look at an American fighter pilot who had loyalties with the enemy and would go on to actually steal an American aircraft and would become the first ever U.S. military officer to be convicted of treason. Martin James Monty was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1921 as one of seven children. Despite being placed in an ideal situation to grow up as a completely normal American boy, he found himself exposed to influences that would have a profound effect on his life decisions later on. His father and mother had both immigrated to the United States from Italy. In addition, on his mother's side, he had a strong tie to German ancestry as well. Likely because of these ties, in the 1930s, Monty was a staunch anti-communist and enthusiastic supporter of radio host Charlie Coughlin. Coughlin made a weekly radio broadcast that attracted millions of listeners and was well known for his anti-Semitic stances and admiration for the fascist governments of Germany and Italy, both of which were taking center stage in world news at the time as their dictators rapidly tried to expand their country's borders. These backgrounds and influences would likely stir deep convictions inside him after the attack on Pearl Harbor as both Germany and Italy, his two beloved ancestral countries, entered a war with the United States. In October of 1942, less than a year after Pearl Harbor, Monty would travel to Detroit to meet and conversate with his admired radio host Charlie Coughlin. Although we don't have much details on this conversation, it is safe to assume that it had a profound influence on the young Monty and would play a role in his actions to come. Just eight weeks later, the 21-year-old signed up for and enlisted in the United States Army Air Force. In 1943 and 44, he completed flight training and became an officer. He was qualified in both the P-39 Air Cobra and the P-38 Lightning. Shortly thereafter, he was shipped overseas and found himself in the Middle East as part of the 126th Replacement Depot where he was awaiting to be assigned to a combat squadron. However, he then opted to go AWOL and hitched a flight to Cairo, Egypt aboard a transport plane. From here, he traveled on his own to what he felt was his homeland of Italy. While he was in the area of the Pomigliano Airfield, currently under the control of the U.S. Army Air Force, he noticed that there was a P-38 parked near the runway that was used for reconnaissance. It had been undergoing maintenance and would need a test flight very soon. He then concocted a plan and posed as a member of the 82nd Fighter Group when talking to staff at the airfield. He then cunningly talked his way into doing the test flight for this aircraft. Instead of taking it on the normal test flight that was required, however, Monty took off in the American twin-engine fighter and had no intention of ever bringing it back. Taking to the air just north of Naples, he gained some altitude and set a course for Milan, which was currently held by German forces. Upon arriving at a German airfield in the area, he somehow avoided taking any ground fire and was able to land the P-38 successfully. Upon parking the aircraft, he was taken into custody by German soldiers and was treated as a normal prisoner of war. However, he tried to convince them that his actions were sincere and that he was truly loyal to the Italian and German side of the conflict. Because of these arguments, the Germans eventually believed his story. It also likely helped that the American radio broadcast in the area also issued a call for his arrest which helped his case greatly. His P-38 Lightning would be commandeered and sent to the Zircus Rosarius, 
an elite Luftwaffe unit that specialized in the testing of Allied aircraft that were captured in flying condition. This sort of capture was very valuable to their unit because it would allow German pilots and commanders to better understand how the American fighters worked and what the best strategies were to use against them. After being accepted by the Germans, he participated in propaganda radio broadcast for the Nazi media under the alias of Martin Wiedhaupt. After this, he joined in the Waffen SS and aided in the distribution and creation of propaganda leaflets that were to be handed out to Allied prisoners of war. Unfortunately for Monty, however, fate would show him that he had chosen the wrong side of the war, when defeat quickly became imminent for the Axis forces. In an attempt to try and escape this fate, he once again tried to flee, this time to the American forces. He intentionally surrendered to American soldiers, where he attempted to explain that he had stolen the aircraft because he was bored and that he thought he could personally fight the Germans by himself. But he then said that he was shot down and ended up joining the fight with resistance forces. This was obviously a lie, but at the time the American higher-ups had no knowledge of his contributions to Nazi propaganda, so his story was believed and his sentencing was light as he was only charged with theft of aircraft. He was actually even allowed back into the US military service as a private. Two years later, however, in 1948, after reaching the rank of sergeant and serving without a hiccup, he was honorably discharged from the US Army Air Force. But only minutes later, he was arrested by FBI agents at Mitchell Field in New York, who charged him with treason after they had successfully identified him as the German propaganda voice Martin Wiedhaupt. To the surprise of many, in his trial for treason the following year, he pleaded guilty to all charges. His attorney asked for leniency in his sentencing based on the claim that he was brought up in an extremist environment that imbued him to identify with the Italians and Germans. Throughout this sentence, Monty would repeatedly attempt to withdraw his guilty plea and have his charges reversed by various questionable and unproven claims that he did not intend to commit treason. All of these would be denied. By 1960, he was released and lived out the remainder of his life quietly in Florida before passing away in 2000 at the age of 78. I hope you enjoyed this historical recreation. Please make sure to click subscribe and comment if you have any ideas for future videos. If you want to support my content and get awesome bonus videos, please check out the Patreon link in the description of this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.